Brandon, don't go too far. Sit where I can see you. He goes, oh no. You might want to be afraid. I'm not preaching at you, I promise, okay? Today's, the name of the sermon today is Stand Firm. And I thought that uh, as I was going through and praying over what the Lord would have me to speak, now I did this, I mean, several months ago. I, I put out my preaching schedule for um, several months and so that I can start preparing and do other things uh, to get ready to preach. And I thought it was interesting that on July 5th, We would be in Philippians, and the name of the sermon would be Stand Firm, because in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul gives a command to the church to stand firm, to stand firm on what they believe, to stand firm on what they know, to stand firm on their faith, regardless of what is going against them, regardless of what is being uh, thrown at them, regardless of the obstacles that are being placed before them. He is calling the church to stand firm. And on this July 5th, with all that's going on in the world, the the seemingly chaotic, just uh, chaos that that is in our cities and uh, around this nation, the the coronavirus, which, um, and rightfully so, there are people that are concerned about it and people that aren't here because they feel more comfortable staying at home, but, but then... There's all these restrictions, all these things that we have to to do. And we as the church need to set an example. I believe that. We need to be above reproach, uh, but we also don't need to allow our freedoms to be trampled on. But in order to set an example, in order to be above reproach, in order to to, uh, set the standard for folks, we have to know what God's standard is. And we have to stand firm on that standard Regardless of what somebody tries to move you off of it, regardless if somebody tries to persecute you, regardless if they try to shut church down, regardless if they try to shut worship down, whatever they try to do, we can still stand firm on God's Word. Now, this is the only time I'm going to look at you directly. And this was just serendipity that you were here and that they were going to you know, maybe call you up in 24 hours. You're going to go away from all that is familiar to you. And you're going to be put into an environment that is challenging, to say the least. Anybody that's gone through basic training or gone into the military will know that. Your beliefs are going to be challenged. You're going to be put in the position where all of a sudden, and really all of us can be put in this position at any time, For we have to stand up for what we believe. We have to stand up for our faith. We have to stand up for our uh, ourselves. If we call ourselves Christians, then we can't slink into the shadows. We can't equivocate. We can't uh, waffle on what we believe. You have to know what you believe and you have to stand firm on it. Because all of a sudden you're going to be challenged in ways that you've never been challenged before. But that's really true for all of us. And especially in this day and age, I'm going to leave you alone now. Except to say, man, that I want a picture after they get all that hair off of you. <laughs> but in this day and age, I, you know, I, I thought about saying in this day and age, it's never more important that the church stand firm. But, you know, it's never been more important every day of your life that you stand firm on what you believe. But I can see the, the way the world is going. I can see the darkness creeping in. I can see that those that are called by the name of Jesus, that are called His children, are called to a higher purpose. We are called to be witnesses, to be ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven, to be the examples that set out a shining light in the midst of the darkness. And it can be a lonely place. It can be a difficult place. It can be a place where you're persecuted. It can be a place where you can even lose your life. There are places in this world that to speak the name of Jesus is is literally a death sentence. Not in this country yet. But I guarantee you, you go out and start speaking the name of Jesus and start witnessing to people, and you're going to get a lot more pushback than you would have 20 years ago. 
And the sad thing is, 20 years ago, we weren't going out doing all the things that we need to do today. More people are willing to go out and be ridiculed for the cause of Christ, to knock on a door, to speak to a neighbor, or to uh, strike up a conversation with uh, a stranger. Whatever it is, more and more people called by the name of Jesus are willing to do that. And the environment is getting more and more hostile. But when you stand firm in your faith, you know what happens? It puts Christ first. And that's a command that was given to all of us. See, your life is no longer your own. You've been bought with a price. You've been purchased. You've been redeemed. You've been forgiven. You've been empowered. You've been strengthened. You've been called friend. You were homeless and now you have a home. You were alone and now you're always with somebody. You see, when we stand firm on our faith, it puts Christ first. It, it can't help but put Christ first. But what does it mean to stand on our faith? Well, several months back I talked about what were the 12 non-negotiables of the faith. You need to know what it is you believe so that you can stand firm in those things. Paul here in the letter to the Philippians has given them several things that they need to work on, that they need to stand firm on. They need to worry about their relationship with the world. They need to worry about their relationship with each other. But most importantly, they need to make sure that their relationship with Christ is correct so that they can rightly relate to the world and to each other. And Paul here in Philippians is, is beginning to, to close out the argument. He's about to close out the letter. But, you know, in this day and age, it's easy to say there's a lot that competes for your time, isn't there? Now, before the coronavirus, I would say that it would have been sports or leisure or vacations or uh, work or children or family or all of these kinds of things. So now with the coronavirus and all of us kind of uh, quarantining at home, it's which shows are you going to binge watch? What closet are you going to clean out? And by the way, y'all should have every closet cleaned out by now. Are you on the fifth time of reorganizing your garage? All of these things, though, are things that we choose sometimes over building our faith. Because we're so busy. We put God second or third or fourth. And remember, He's got to have first place. Are, are you willing to put Him first? Are you willing to put yourself second? Are you willing to stand firmly on His word, on His commands, and on His sovereignty? I just lied to you. I said I wasn't going to talk to you anymore, but, but I'm going to talk to you. You're going to understand sovereignty because when an officer or an NCO or somebody that has the authority gives you an order, you're going to have no choice but to obey it. Now, if, you, if we could only translate that into the Christian life, when, when you read an order or a command from the, the Word of God, wouldn't it be great if each one of us thought, well, I have no choice but to obey it? We've got to stand firm. We have to recognize that Jesus has the right to command us. He's purchased us. And you know what, if we're not willing to stand firm, even in this day, in this darkness, if we're not willing to stand firm, if we're not going to stand resolute in our faith, you know what, we can be in danger of losing our place. In the society, with our friends, with all that we hold dear. In short, church, if we don't stand firm on our faith in this day and right now at this time, we can become irrelevant very quickly. Christ will never become irrelevant, but Deer Park First Baptist could. And any other church that calls on the name of Christ, if they're not willing to stand on their faith. But even worse than that, even worse than that, we could find ourselves as enemies of the cross. Now, Brother Jim, how is it that a church could become an enemy of the cross? And remember, Paul is writing to the church. We always tend to think of Paul writing to individuals, but he is writing to the church. How could we become enemies of the cross? 
Well, there's really kind of two ways, okay? Either we're in rebellion or we're apostate. I hate to use that word rebellion. It means disobedient. If we're not willing to stand firm on what we know that is true, and, and Paul, up in verse 16, it says, listen, you need to live up to whatever truth you have attained. If we're not willing to, to stand firm on that, then we are in rebellion, both as a church and individually. If we're not willing to follow the commands that Jesus has given us, who has the right, the legal authority, to give us those commands then we are in rebellion. And I guarantee you, the the world is watching, aren't they, Ernest? The world watches the Christians. And when we don't live up to the standard that God set, we're on the 6 o'clock news. Just let a pastor fall in some way, shape, form, or fashion, and it's on the news. If we don't stand firm for what we believe, they're going to watch us. They're looking to see how we act. They're looking to see what we do. They're looking to see how we live. And they may not approve of our lives, but I guarantee you they will highlight our failures and our hypocrisy. If they know the Bible says we're to forgive one another and we don't forgive, they're going to highlight it. Well, that's one way that we can become enemies of the cross, by not living according to God's word. The other way is we could just be apostate. We could think that we believed when we really didn't. We could think that we're Christians. We've we've gone through the, the motions. We've walked down the aisle. We've been in the baptismal waters. But we don't care one whit about following the commands of Jesus. We don't think one moment about him throughout the week. In fact, we only go to church when it's convenient to us. We only come because somebody might see us. We don't really care about following through on the commands of God. And when that happens, the saddest part is you're lost and you don't even know it. And you're an enemy of the cross. See, you can be in rebellion and still be saved, but you're still an enemy of the cross. But if you're apostate, you're not really saved. And the sad thing is, you're still bringing down the name of Jesus. Because there's no fruit in your life. There's no evidence of a changed life. There's nothing that you could look at and say, that person walks with Jesus. And that's the sad thing. Paul is highlighting those things. But when we stand firm in God's word, when we hide his word in our heart, when we begin to live it out, when we ask him every night, Lord, make me more like you, when we wake up every morning and say, God, help me walk through this day, when we spend time in his word, when we hunger and thirst after righteousness, when we want to be in his presence, he's going to listen to us and he's going to change us. He's going to make us into what he wants us to be. Church, we have got to stand firm. If you would, please stand as we read, starting with verse uh, 17. We're going to read through chapter 4, verse 1. Paul is writing to this church that he loves, and he says, Join in imitating me, brothers, and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For I've often told you, and I now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame. They're focused on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of His glorious body by the power that enables Him to subject everything to Himself. So then, in this way, my dearly loved brothers, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Stand firm. You may be seated. As we get to verse 17, the first thing that you see is 
Paul is calling us to imitate imitation, not impersonation. Now, what's the difference? Imitation versus impersonation. Well, if you come, well, if we'd had VBS, you'd have probably seen me try to use some sort of accent. Okay, I was going to be uh, a German doctor, and I was going to talk like this to the children. I'm imitating. Okay, now. All my accents always kind of go back to an Australian accent. Because it's hard to have an accent and talk at the same time. And for some reason, it would always go back to an Australian accent. But that's imitation. And, and, and I'm really trying to entertain the kids. I'm trying to get their attention. I want them to, to like being there. I want them to be a part of it. So I'm really trying to entertain. But sometimes, imitation is to defraud. Sometimes you act like somebody that you aren't in order to get an advantage over somebody you want to take advantage of. And so Paul is not calling us to impersonation. He's not calling Christians to impersonate him and everybody in here be a little Paul. Which also means not everybody's called to go and start churches. Not everybody's called to, to be a missionary. Not everybody's called to preach. Not everybody's called to teach. But everybody is called to something. And everybody has a purpose in the kingdom of God. And nothing is without value. Every person that is called by the name of Jesus, that is called a Christian, has a purpose, has value, has something that God has brought you into the kingdom to do. And so if you find yourself doing nothing... You might want to ask him, okay, God, what do I need to do? And more importantly, if you say, God, I want something to do, and he, he brings you to a food ministry. Oh, no, no, God, I want something really bigger. No, no, I want you in the food ministry. No, I want something bigger. Just, pardon the expression, shut up and go to the food ministry, okay? <laughs> go do what God has for you to do, and do it with all your heart. Paul was calling folks to imitation, to model him, not to imitate him. Not only did Paul want folks to become like him in how they lived, he wanted them to obey the commands that God had given them. And so Paul would set the example. He says, he says it right here. He says, join me. Join me, he says, He didn't want clones. He wanted followers. He wanted fellow workers. He wanted people to be the witnesses, ambassadors that he knew that they were called to be. They didn't have the New Testament. They, didn't, they weren't able to go down to the local Lifeway store, which we can't do anymore either. We have to go online. But we can't go down to your local bookstore, buy a Bible, and, and thumb through and see what God wants you to do. Now, we're blessed because we can do that. But he would still tell them, I want you to follow my example. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But what he's trying to say is, you, you go and you be like Christ, okay? I'm living the life, you need to live the life. Now, not only did Paul say join him, but Paul, well, he talked the talk and he walked the walk. Paul would take new converts and he would take them and he would begin to teach them what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. He would lead somebody to Christ and he would begin to teach them. He would, he would uh, pour into them the truths that he knew that they were going to need in order to, to walk this Christian life. How many of us do that? Or do you look at the church and you say, Pastor, that's your job. Or Sunday school teacher or adult Bible fellowship, that's your job. Can I tell you, each one of you has that opportunity at some point in your life to pour into a new Christian and to teach them what it is to walk with Christ. But that puts responsibility on you. That means you have to actually know <laughs> what you got to teach them, right? The second thing that you would see Paul do is he would mentor others. He took Luke. He took uh, John Mark. He took different people on his missionary journeys. He taught them how to teach and how to preach and how to start churches. He took Timothy. He loved Timothy. And he poured into them so that as they moved from being 
uh, babes in Christ to becoming mature Christians, he could now set them into a place and say, all right, now you go do the same. How many of y'all mentor somebody? You know why most people don't? Two reasons. I don't know enough, but here's the real big one. That's the excuse, I don't know enough. The big one is, I don't have the time. And you know what it really is? You're not willing to make the time. We need to pour into people and help them learn how to live and help them learn how to do our jobs. Because I hope one day somebody's going to take over for me. Down the road, but I hope one day. And it'd be pretty cool if I got to pour into their life and it was somebody that I got to mentor. But I'll tell you, at Everman, I got to mentor 10 young men Eight are still in the ministry, preaching in churches. And, and one of the things I tried to teach them was, you need to replicate yourself. And I'm already blessed here. I already have one or two men that I get to meet with on a regular basis. And I'm starting to pour my life into them. I wish I could do that with everybody, but you can only do it with about two or three over a year time frame. I'll get around to you one day, I hope. The third thing you would see do, Paul demonstrated through how he lived the Christian life. Whether he's being persecuted, whether he's being ridiculed, he still lived the Christian life. I hope that each one of us can say the same. Because most of us are going to face persecution or ridicule of some sort. And how you respond to that says what you believe. Jesus said, don't worry about those that can take your life. Worry about the person that can take your very soul. Talking about his Father in heaven. What can man do to you? He can hurt and harm the body, but I I got a retirement plan that's out of this world. Because I know where I'm going. And that emboldens you. It strengthens you. It helps you to walk this walk. To imitate Paul. To be like Christ. And then he says to observe others. He goes, Join in imitating me, brothers, and observe those who live according to the examples they have in us. Not only did Paul say, look at me, but he said, look at some of the the people that I've poured into. Timothy was one of those. Epaphroditus was one of those. And you can go through the New Testament and you can see what God did through them. He says, listen, don't just look at me, but look at those that are walking with Christ. Imitate Ernest. Imitate Paul. Imitate Mike. Only not so loud. Imitate those around you. Ladies, find a godly woman. Begin to learn. Observe those around and walk like them. He says, listen, you need to follow good examples. Those that are mature. But, they're, but here's a warning. If there are good examples to follow, you know what that means? There's also some bad examples to follow. And if you don't know what it is you believe, you can be sucked into those bad examples and be taught wrong. I don't have time to go through some of the things that I had to unlearn from when I was young. But I have had to le- unlearn some things in order to learn the truth. And we all should do that. There's an old saying out there, every father wants his son to be better than he is. Everybody that pours their life into somebody ought to want that person to exceed your knowledge, your walk, your righteousness, your life. That should be your goal, that they do better than you in this walk. So Paul is going on, and and in verses 18 and 19, he gives this tearful warning. Verse 18, he says, For I have often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross. Enemies of the cross. That's kind of scary, isn't it? He's recognizing people within the church 
that might be living as enemies of the cross. Now, most people think that he was talking about Judaizers, people that were coming in and trying to tell them, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to live this way, you got to follow the law. We have modern day Judaizers in the church. You got to wear the certain thing. Notice I didn't wear a tie today. But preachers are supposed to wear ties, right? You got to sing the right songs. If you're in a Baptist church, don't raise your hands. Don't, don't raise your hands. People might think you're about to jump over a pew or something. Be careful the songs you sing. We have Judaizers within the church that try to make tradition into law. So Paul was, back then, they were trying to make them follow the food laws, make them follow uh, all the Old Testament laws. They were trying to make them do that. But it could have been that Paul was talking about someone who was an antinomian. Oh, that's a big word, isn't it? An antinomian is somebody who, who feels because of the grace they've been given, they're no longer obligated to follow after the commands of Jesus. In other words, I got my fire insurance, I can live however I want to live. And they don't care. It's a heresy. But they, they want to live however they want to live. And they believe that all that matters was that they were saved. You know how that exhibits itself in the church today? Someone walks down the aisle, they get saved, they get into the baptismal waters, and then you never see them again. I'm really going to step on toes, except on Christmas and Easter. They become Christers. And they only come because they feel like they have to. Well, why should I be in church? I'm saved. Why do I need to go to church? Why do I need to gather together as a body of believers? Why do I need to come together in fellowship? One, God commands it. In Hebrews, he says, don't forsake us. We got it written up on the wall out here, by the way. Don't forsake assembling together as some are in the habit of doing, especially as the days grow dark. And people, the days are pretty dark. We need to gather together to encourage one another, to strengthen one another, to lift one another up, to, to uh, help one another in, in life. We need to do that. So there was either the Judaizers or there was the antinomians. And Paul says, listen, here's their end. Look at verse 19. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame, and they are focused on earthly things. Paul talks about the end that is going to come to them, and he gives four things that's going to happen to them. These Judaizers or these people that are antinomian, it's going to end in destruction for them. It's not going to end well. You know, the funny thing is, as a Christian... If you stand up and you're killed for your faith, martyred in some countries where that still happens, people say, oh, that's horrible. But that person wins because they have now entered into eternal life. The person here that tries to be too careful, not offend anybody, not get into any conflict with anybody because they don't want to be hurt or harmed, and they really find out that they're really not Christian because, you know, it doesn't really matter how I live. I, I walk down the aisle. I'm, I'm saved. Or they're so focused on how you do things in church that they just can't be in church. They're so worried about that that they're in this destruction. That's what Paul says. They're trying to live a, a, a certain life here on this earth and, and it's not going to end well for them. Galatians 5, 4 says, You who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. Then Paul goes on to say that they're living in this lust-filled life. They worship the carnal. They, they only care about satisfying self, their physical desires. For the Judaizer, it was the food laws. Watch out what you eat. Can't eat that. For the antinomians... It was, hey, pile it on. I want to go to the buffet. I want to eat all that I can. It doesn't really matter. I'm saved. It doesn't matter about this body. I can do whatever I want to it. And you can put it into any other scenario that you want. It could be sexual lust. It could be, uh, it could be material gain. It could be all of those kinds of things. Anything that becomes a god to you, then you're antinomian. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, God said. And anybody that tries to say, well, you got to do it this way without going to God's Word and is trying to make or force somebody into a certain pattern of worship, you're a Judaizer. Can't put it any other way that way. When you try to force somebody else to do what you think is the right thing. But when you live a life standing on faith, 
and your life is, about, is beyond reproach, then I can look at somebody and say, man, that's somebody I want to be like. I want to be like Ernest. I want to be like him. I want to follow him. Gentle spirit proclaims the truth. He's not afraid, but he's not overbearing. He didn't bring his thumb down on anybody, not that I've ever seen. Now, y'all can tell me some stories when he was pastoring here later. But that's a man I would want to be like. And I hope that one day y'all would want to be like me. Or like my wife or other godly people that are in this church. But he says, listen, they live a lust-filled life. All, it's, all that matters to them is satisfying self. And it says there's this false glory. Look at all that I've accomplished. But without Jesus, you've accomplished nothing. Look at all that I can do. But without Him leading you, it doesn't matter. Look at all that I've gained. Can't take it with you. Doesn't matter if it's not building up treasures in heaven, serving the King, living for Him. It doesn't matter. Paul says they have a carnal mind. They're only out for self. They look out for their own accomplishments, or their own credentials, their own law-keeping status. That's the Judaizers, the antinomians once... And if they got saved, it doesn't matter what the consequences are. Colossians 3, 2 says, Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are in the earth. Folks, if we want to stand firm, we better get our attention on Jesus. We get, better get our minds on standing on His Word and living the life He's called us to live. That's the enemy's end. Paul is really getting tough with the church. He's really getting tough with this church that he loves because he loves them so much he doesn't want them to fall into this trap. He doesn't want them to fall into that. You know, these must have been horrible people that he was talking about. So concerned with earthly trivia, right? That worship wasn't even on their minds. They didn't have time for it. They would rather be thinking about dinner arrangements or weekly appointments. They were so consumed with, with work or with leisure that worship just became inconvenient. Sound familiar? This is Paul talking to the church 2,000 years ago, but doesn't that sound familiar today? You could hear a pin drop in this place. And I'm in the midst of that too. Folks, we've got to stand firm on God's word or we're going to fall. And worse than that, we risk being enemies of the cross. We, we risk bringing discredit to the name of Jesus when we're not willing to live the life He's called us to live. That's the hard thing. But Brother Jim, I've just, I've just done my best. Quit trying to do your best and yield yourself to God and ask Him to lead you and guide you. Quit trying to do things in your own power and under your own strength. Spend time in the Word. Spend time in prayer. Spend time with each other. Talk about God's Word. Meditate on it. Help one another. Hold one another accountable. Build relationships. Mentor. Or be mentored. Pour into the lives of those around you the knowledge that God has given you because each one of you has a purpose. See, Paul goes on and he gives us some assurances in verses 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven. Odd on this day that we celebrate well, the day after we celebrate our 244th year as a country, that we're talking about, you know, our citizenship as Americans is important to us. But what should be more important to you is your citizenship in heaven. Paul says, listen, church at Philippi, church at Deer Park, you're not of this world. Your citizenship is someplace else. If it wasn't, you wouldn't be called an ambassador. You wouldn't be called to tell others about this life 
as a Christian. Our citizenship. He ties this back to verse 17 where he sits there and he says, Join in imitating your brothers and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For your citizenship is in heaven. Now, how does he tie that back? If you go back and you look at the word there, it's a form of the word polis. Now, I'm giving you a Greek lesson, but I still want to tie it together. In chapter 1, verse 27, he tells the church to live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a form of the word polis. It's politusathe, and say that three times fast. Here, where it talks about citizenship, is politume, still the same base word. When he ties citizenship, and in Greek, when words are joined like that, it joins back to that previous idea. So when he says your citizenship is in heaven, he's also referring back to living your life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if there is a command to live your life worthy, then that means that there is the opportunity to live your life unworthy. Even as a child of God, you can be in rebellion and be disobedient. So, he says, our citizenship is in heaven. Remember when I told you to live your life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Remember when I told you that? Earlier in the letter, Paul is basically saying... Well, if your citizenship is up there, then live like it. If you're a citizen of heaven, act like it. If you're called a child of the king, realize it. Stand firm in that. Put Christ first and live for him. Philippi, when he's writing this, is a, is a Roman city. Remember, Paul used his Roman citizenship once to get out of a scrape. So Roman citizenship was really important. When he's writing to this Roman city and he says, hey, listen, I know that you guys are probably citizens of Rome, but that's not the most important place you need to be thinking about. Your citizenship is in heaven. That's what's important, and that's how you need to live. They need to live in a manner that glorifies the king. In Colossians 3.1, it says, So if you have been raised with the Messiah, seek what is above where the Messiah is, seated at the right hand of God. Why would you want to sit down here on this earth when you've been raised up with him and you are in the heavenlies, seated with him. Now you're going, now you're just being weird. Listen, if you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, you may be still walking on this earth, but you're in the heavenlies with him too. And one day you're going to be all there. And it's going to be great. But until that time, you're here. You're an alien, you're a stranger. You're walking in a strange land now. You've got to walk worthy. You've got to stand firm. You've got to live up to what Christ has called us to live for. He says, listen, here's your focus in the second part of verse 20. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our focus should be looking for Jesus' return. We should be waiting for that every moment. Acts 1.11 tells us that Jesus is going to return in the same way that he left, in the clouds. Okay, we know the mode and the method. We just don't know the time. But Paul reminded us earlier in this letter that we needed to be focused on him as well. Do you remember when Jesus was walking on the earth? Do you remember the parable of the virgins? The ten virgins. Five of them didn't buy oil for their lamp. They weren't ready. The other five went, they got oil for their lamp, they trimmed their lamps, they were ready. Because Jesus said, you don't know when the bridegroom's going to come. And so at midnight, it says that the bridegroom came. And the other five that hadn't gotten prepared said, hey, 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 lend us some of your oil. They said, no way. <laughs> you should have been prepared. They were looking for the bridegroom to come. That was his point in that parable. If Christ didn't first then you're not really looking for him to return. Think about this last week. Just think about this last week. Think about the places you went. Think about the things you thought about. Think about the things you may even have said. 
And then imagine that in the moment you were in that location that you shouldn't have been, thinking that thought you shouldn't have thought, saying that thing that you shouldn't have said, acting that way towards a brother, being unforgiving towards those that you're supposed to forgive. Imagine that in that very moment, Christ said, hey, time to go home. Wouldn't you have been embarrassed, Katha? It's like getting your hand caught in the cookie jar. And somebody out there is saying, yeah, but you know I'm saved. I'm already forgiven for that. I would ask you to raise your hands, but some of y'all would actually raise your hands. And if you're not, I used to think that. Somebody said, oh man, what if Jesus returned right when you were doing that wrong thing? Yeah, but I'm already saved. He's already forgiven me for all my sins, past, present, and future. You know what I'm being when I say that? I'm being antinomian. I'm being, a re- I'm being a rebel. I'm being disobedient. Paul is talking to the church. He's saying, don't be that way. Focus on Christ. Be ready for his return. He said, because in the future... He's going to transform this body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Our future is set. I'm not going to have to increase the belt loop any any more on my pants. I'm going to have a perfect body. I'm not going to have to buy a bigger size of clothes because I've been quarantined for three months and I've put on 10 pounds. I'm not going to have to go walking and limp home because my knee hurts because I've had four knee surgeries. I'm not going to have to worry about my hair falling out. I'm not going to have to go to the hairstylist and get the gray colored out. I'm not going to have to do any of those things because he says, listen, God's going to come and he's going to take the imperfect body, this broken body, and he's going to give you a glorified body. And he's going to do it by the same power that raised him from the dead, that created the universe He's going to do that. That is what we have to look forward to. So we have our citizenship in heaven. This is our assurances. Our focus should be on Jesus, and our future is that we're going to be transformed into his likeness. So how can we float through this life without making him first? There's a theme here, right? We need to make Christ first and stand firm on his word. In verse... 1 of chapter 4, Paul brings all of this together. So then, in this way, my dearly loved brothers, my joy, my crown, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Stand firm. He says, listen, my brothers, my sisters, those of you that I love, that are dear to me, There's no doubt he loved this church. Just as I love this church, and you love this church, and you love the people around you, and you love the people that are sitting next to you, six feet apart, socially distanced, but you love the people that are sitting next to you. You love spending fellowship time with them. But if we love one another, why don't we hold one another accountable? Paul does that at the end of this this verse here. Listen, I love you, and you're my joy. You make me happy. In this way, though, talking about what he's given to them earlier in the letter, get your relationships with the world right. Get your relationships with each other right. Get your relationship with Christ first and foremost right. Walk worthy of the in a manner that is worthy of, the, uh, of a child of the king. Walk in a manner that glorifies him. Focus on him. In this manner, stand firm by doing those things. That's what Paul is ending this letter on. Stand firm by doing these things. In this manner, live for Christ. We're part of God's family, church. We can be the redheaded stepchild. Sorry to everybody that's a redhead. Or we can be living for him. I almost said, and be the good child. 
but there's none good, right? Right, Adrian? But we can try. God's going to discipline us. He's going to bring us back. Hebrews 3, 6 says this, but Christ was faithful as a son over his household. And we are that household. If we hold on to the courage and the confidence of our hope. In order to stand firm, church, it's going to take courage. It's going to take knowledge. It's going to take hope. But we can do it if we'll yield ourselves to Christ, if we'll put Him first and stand firm on His Word. You see, we're to stand firm in our faith by putting Christ first. And that means resisting the negative influences that are out there. Resisting those that are trying to lead us astray. Resisting the temptation to satisfy self rather than be a servant to others. Resisting the temptation to hold on to anger when we're supposed to forgive. Resisting the temptation to disobey a command that we know we're supposed to follow. Resisting the temptation to put self in front of Christ. To stand firm requires perseverance. It requires perseverance when we're opposed, when we're challenged. To stand firm requires endurance. As we live for Christ each and every day, and, and some days you just get up and you're tired. But I want to call you not to lose heart. Jesus is always going to be with you. I'm going to call you to never give up. Jesus says, I'll never forsake you. I'm going to call you to be strong in the Lord. Because through Jesus we get strength. And with the Holy Spirit's help, as we yield ourselves to Him, and with the help of fellow believers as God brings us together, church, we can stand firm and we can stand for Christ. And that's what we're called to do. Amen? Fathers, we come to this time of closing. I just thank you for the opportunity to open your word. <laughs> and Lord, sometimes it's, it's hard. It's hard to, to live on our own, and yet what we're taught is to be independent, to, to depend on self. And what you've called us to do is to be dependent upon you and yield ourselves to you and to come together as a body of believers. Father, help us to stand firm on the truth of your word, not on the lie that we've been taught. Help us, Father, to stand firm uh, in persevering against those that would trip us up or block us or stop us. Help us, Father, to stand firm by learning more about you, by, by living out the, the commands that you've given us, and by serving one another. Help us, Father, to stand firm as a church by being a lighthouse in this community, by making sure that in all things, Lord, you are first. Father, we love you, we praise you, and I just pray that you would uh, continue to watch over us and bless us. And Lord, I pray that you would quicken our hearts to live for you each and every day. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So as we come to the time of invitation, and if you're on the internet and you're watching, I'm not standing next to you now that you took your mic off, or your mask off. Six feet. Yeah, six feet, there you go. Well, kind of like we've talked, uh, because everything's been uh, so strange the last three and a half months, we haven't had bulletins to kind of give us our weekly and monthly updates on where we are. So as Jim and I visited last week, we just wanted to kind of give a real a quick update on where we are with the loan balance. So I believe the last published bulletin we had was near the end of April, and our loan balance at that time was just a hair over $742,000. Um, since we have been blessed and continue to be blessed and have continued the plan, uh, we actually were able to make an extra payment last month's principal of $80,000. So as of July 1st, 2020, our new balance is $637,628. So pretty good. And we'll just keep biting away at that elephant until he's gone. Thank you all very much for coming. Let me pray for you.